Hi, thanks for joining me tonight for Wednesday Online Bible Study. We are glad you're here. And tonight is our last lesson on the difficult scriptures to understand. And I hope you've enjoyed the past six lessons. We talked about the call of Abram. We talked about the wars of extermination. We talked about those imprecatory songs. We talked about the puzzling sayings of Jesus. We talked about the risen Christ. And then last week, the New Testament passages. Which one was your favorite? Let us know in the comments. It's always good for us to know that someone's out there listening and enjoying our lessons. And let me tell you, not only were they difficult scriptures to understand, they were difficult to teach. So give a big thank you to Sister B and Jonathan, because I know we all put in a lot of study hours to make sure we brought you the truth in God's Word each and every Wednesday. Amen. Are you ready to get started with our last lesson for tonight? Let me ask you this. If there's one book in the Bible that's the most difficult to understand, what would you say it is? The book of Revelation, right? Now, there's a mention of churches, names of churches. There's a mentions of bowls and seals and trumpets and angels, creatures and images. A lot of symbolism that we just don't understand, right? I should have let Sister J or Pastor present this lesson tonight because they've got Bible school diplomas, right? But we should not fear the book of Revelation. And can I tell you that this is an interesting read? Let me give you a spoiler here. In the end, we win. The book is exactly what the title says. It's a revelation, an unveiling, a divine disclosure. Actually, the first five words of chapter 1 describe and summarize what this book is about. In verse 1, 1, it says, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. The book is of, by, from, and about Jesus Christ. And even though we know it speaks of mysteries that we don't understand now, it speaks of futuristic events that will take place and which one day we will be a part of. Amen? A.W. Tozer, who was a theologian and a pastor, he stated this about the book of Revelation. He said, We need not decipher and decode mysterious symbols to determine the outcome of this conflict of the ages. There is a plain and radiant theme from the beginning to the end of the revelation. Jesus is victor. Amen? Amen. So while the title of our devotion tonight is Mysteries in the Revelation, we will only cover a few because it would be impossible to cover the entire book right here and now. But I do encourage you, take some time to read the book of Revelation. Pray that God will give you the understanding so that you will no, no longer view it as something to avoid, but that you will look at it as good news that your Redeemer lives. Amen? Amen. So let me have your undivided attention, and let's look here at what our key verse is for tonight. It says, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. Amen. So let me give you a little introduction to the book of Revelation. The book is a revelation from Jesus Christ about himself. And the first five words, like I mentioned, state it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this revelation was revealed to the Apostle John supernaturally through Jesus, angels, and visions. It was revealed to John 60 to 65 years after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And during John's time, Christians in the Roman Empire were experiencing persecution under the rule of Domitian. Now, this Roman emperor demanded that all his subjects address him as Lord and God. So, obviously, this created a dilemma for the Christians who believed that only Jesus was Lord and God. Amen. Now, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation are addressed to the seven churches of Asia during that time. Now, Jesus is revealing to John his evaluation of the churches after he ascended. Now, there were other congregations at the time, but these seven churches were selected to represent the whole of the church during that time. Now, the first mystery we encounter is in Revelation chapter 1, where John greets the seven churches. So let me read it and listen for something that perhaps you've never heard of before. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, 
Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the things of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What stood out to you? Did you catch something that perhaps you've never really heard of before? The seven spirits before his throne. Now, for starters, we see the number seven here referenced twice, the seven churches and the seven spirits. Now, we're all familiar with God's word that says God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? Now, this statement that we just read does not mean that there are seven spirits. There is only one Holy Spirit. Amen. The sevenfold spirit describes the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. In other words, characteristics that clearly describe the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have a study Bible, you'll see a note for that verse four that references Isaiah 11 verse two. Now, in this Old Testament passage, the prophet Isaiah describes the vision of the same spirit that would be God's presence in the life life of the expected Messiah. Let's read it. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The number seven is associated with fulfillment, completion, perfection. So the reference to the sevenfold spirit is only describing for us the completeness, the perfection found in his Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you realize that this is the same spirit that lives in you and me? Since the day we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, his spirit lives in us. Romans 8 reminds us of this. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So the Holy Spirit brings us knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and counsel. Therefore, we are truly led by the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Now, the book of Revelation can be broken down into three main sections. So let's look at the first, letters to the churches. We will find the letters to the churches found in chapters 1 through 3, and they all have a similar format. Each letter begins with a revelation of Jesus, and then each church has either a commendation and or a criticism. And then each church is giving a warning or a challenge. So let's look at those three areas in just two of the letters to the churches. Let's look first at the letter to the church of Ephesus. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, Jesus had just explained in chapter 1, verse 20, that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and that the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
So let's look here at the revelation of Jesus in this letter to the church of Ephesus. He identifies himself as the one with all authority who holds the seven stars firmly in his hand. And the churches are under his direction and care because he walks among the churches in their midst. Now, Jesus commends the churches for honoring them with their service, even though it involved difficulty and hardship. He commends them for their patient endurance and not putting up with the evil around them. The Ephesian church did not tolerate false teachers. They held on to the doctrine taught by the apostles. But here's the criticism that Jesus gives them in verse 4. He reveals their flaw. The church had left their first love. Now, while the church was dutifully giving to the Lord their service, they were not giving themselves. They no longer had an intimate relationship with God. They were not pouring out their hearts to God in love and in praise. They did their Christian duty, but they lacked Christ-like compassion. They lacked their love, their intimacy for God. So here's the warning that Jesus gives them in verse 5. Remember, repent, and do. He says, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So if the church failed to repent, then Jesus would no longer walk in their midst. Can you imagine a church where the presence of God is no longer there? That would be an empty place both physically and spiritually. So what can we take from this letter to the Ephesian church back then and apply to our lives today? Verse seven tells us it's a challenge for anyone in all the churches back then as much as today. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You know, the hearing ear means one who listens and responds with faith and obedience. We have to live as overcomers, amen? We can win those victories only through Christ. The Apostle John had written about that earlier in 1 John chapter 2. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So may our love for God only increase day by day. Amen. May all that we do, whether in words, actions, or thoughts, glorify our Father who is in heaven. Amen. Now let's look at the other letter to the church of Laodicea. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So let's see here what the revelation of Jesus is in this letter. Jesus reveals himself as the Amen which in Hebrew means certainty or truth. So Jesus guarantees the truth of God's promises. He is the faithful and true witness. He bears witness to the Father, to the truth of the gospel. He will not go back on his word, amen. He is the beginning of all creation. He is ruler of all creation. He always was, always is, and always will be, amen. 
He is the one through whom all things were begun and he will be the one who will bring all of God's plan to its final consummation. Now here's a criticism of the church of Laodicea. It appears here that the Laodiceans were acting as if they forgot who Jesus was and why he died. They had slipped into a dangerous state, lukewarmness. Their prosperity and wealth and their possessions had taken priority and they neglected their spiritual lives. So they were living in self-satisfaction with their wealth that they had no desire for God whatsoever. They were not moved to share the gospel. They had no compassion for the needs of others. They were not troubled by the false teachings. They were not doing anything for God and they were not responding to his calls for repentance. God could neither use them or bless them. So here's the challenge. While Jesus offered no commendation for this church, he still offered hope. And all they had to do was repent and turn their hearts and their attitudes toward him. Rather than their material wealth, he wanted them to be rich in faith. He wanted them to be clothed in his righteousness, and he wanted them to have a clear vision of the truth. So this letter to the church of Laodicea serves as a warning for us today, right? Do not neglect your spiritual life. May each day we receive our spiritual strength from God's word. Amen. May we allow his Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. May he move our hearts to share the gospel with others, to have compassion for those in need. Amen. And may we always be bold to stand for the truth. May we place ourselves in a position where God can use us and God can bless us. Amen. Let's move on to the second section in the book of Revelation that deals with visions in heaven. Now there is something very exciting and very important that you and I have to understand that takes place between chapters 3 and 4. Now those first three chapters are letters to the churches back then, but those lessons learned apply to us today as the church. Amen? So from chapter 4 and on, it will describe future events that will take place during the time of the tribulation. So those terrifying events that we will read about from chapter 4 and on, they are not to be experienced by the church, the bride of Christ. Why? How do we know this? Let's go back and look at chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. For God did not appoint us to wrath, amen, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you can say glory to God? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Amen. God did not appoint us to wrath. So chapters four and on, they don't apply to me and you. We won't be here. We will be in glory with Christ. Amen. Now, in chapters four through 15, we will find great apocalyptic, which end of the world, okay, visions that were given to John. Now, much of the language in the chapters are symbolic. But one thing to keep in mind is that the symbols represent realities. Now, for example, Jonathan mentioned the Antichrist last week. This is a real person. In the book of Revelation, he is symbolized as a beast. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, is symbolized as a lamb. He's a very real person, and he is coming for his church. Amen? Now, the great dragon or the old serpent that you will find mentioned in the book of Revelation is referring to Satan. Now, all these chapters focus on the coming judgments that will bring an end to this present age. But the very first vision that John writes about is the throne of heaven. Now, Jesus reveals here to John what is most important, that God and Jesus Christ our Lord are in control. Amen. They are sovereign. Amen. Let's look here at Revelations chapter 4. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and the one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. 
Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Now John here describes the total radiance of God's throne. We can only try to imagine it with our human minds, but this describes God's glory in pure light and total holiness. So I'm sure after reading the scripture, you have some questions, right? Who are the 24 elders sitting on those 24 thrones? The scripture passage here does not specifically tell us who the elders are, but other passages give us a little bit more information. One thing we do know is that they're not angels, because in Revelation 5 verse 11, we are told that angels, thousands of angels, ten thousands of angels are around the throne of God, around the elders, and around the creatures, the living creatures that we read about. So they are outside encircling, and those elders are within that circle. So we also are told that these elders are wearing crowns. Now, no one else is symbolized as wearing crowns. But who do we know based on other scripture passages that will have crowns? We will. Let's look here at 2 Timothy 4.8. It tells us, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. 1 Peter 5, 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So here it is believed that the 24 elders represent the total church of God in the Old and New Covenants, the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles. Isn't that wonderful? We're also told in Revelation 21 that the names of the 12 tribes are on the gates and the names of the 12 apostles are on the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. Amen. So note that in verse 5, we see the mention of the sevenfold spirit of God again, right? The seven spirits of God. In verse 6, John sees four living creatures with eyes all over. What could this symbolize? Now the scripture passage in verses 7 through 9 describes for us that each of these creatures is distinct in their appearance like a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. And day and night they never stop worshiping God. Whenever they give glory and honor and thanks to God on the throne, the 24 elders fall down and worship and lay their crowns before him. Now we're not told who these creatures are, but scholars believe that they represent all of God's living creation, all nature who will praise God. And just stop and think. One day, we will be in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and everyone in unison will be worshiping. Our God sits on the throne. Amen. And right now, Jesus is sitting at his right hand, interceding for me and you. Amen. And he's promised that one day he will come back and take us to be where he is. Amen. Are you anticipating that day? Are you looking forward to that day? Can you say with me, Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus? Amen. Now from chapters 5 on through 15, you will read about the coming judgments that will come upon the earth. And I wish I had time to cover every one of them in detail, but there's just not enough time to do that. But like I mentioned at the beginning, I just wanted to get you comfortable enough so that you will go back and read this book with that excitement, knowing that your Redeemer is coming for you. Amen? Amen. Now let's look at the last section of the book of Revelation, which covers chapters 16 through 22, which addresses the more severe judgments of the final days of the tribulation. And this is called the end time conflict. Now, chapter 16 begins with describing the seven plagues, the last seven plagues. Now, these are symbolized by the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. And these plagues are sores, sea as blood, fresh water becomes blood, 
great scorching of the sun, darkness, a preparation for Armageddon, and earthquake and hail. Now the book of Revelation reveals what is in store for both the believer and the unbeliever. Today I just wanted to dwell on those events that you and I as believers have to look forward to. Because you and I are washed by the blood of the Lamb, we will not experience those final judgments that will take place at the very end of the age. Amen? Amen. So as we close our devotion tonight, let's look at the parts of chapter 19 that deal with the end of the tribulation and Christ's glorious second coming as he comes to the earth to destroy the ungodly and reign with his people. Listen as I read chapter 19. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. It is obvious that the one sitting on this white horse is our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But did you catch verse 14 that describes the armies of heaven that will follow him on white horses? Who do we know that has been washed and cleansed? We are by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So to make sure John understands who these people are, it was revealed to him that these are God's chosen and faithful followers. Can you just imagine the vision that John saw of all the faithful followers of Christ of all time coming behind Jesus Christ our Lord? What a sight. And you and I will be a part of those armies of heaven. Amen. We will follow our victor, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now chapter 20 goes on to describe the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. And it ends with Satan's doom and the judgment of all the wicked. Chapter 21 speaks of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, the holy city where God will dwell with his people. And this is what John heard as he saw the vision of this holy city coming down from heaven. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This is it. This is when everything that was purchased for us on the cross by Christ's death and guaranteed to us by his resurrection is all made complete and final. Amen. The last enemy to be destroyed was death. This is total victory. No longer will we be separated from God. He will dwell among us. There will be no sin. There will be no wickedness. There will be complete purity and holiness 
in the presence of our God. The scripture foretells that there will be no need for a sea, a sun, or even a moon. Why? The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. This is the glory that awaits us. Amen. Amen. We just need to continue walking in fellowship with Jesus. He is our light. Amen. While we await his return, his Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us and help us. Amen. I told you in the end, we win. Amen. We win. Let's read here. Revelation 22 as we close this devotion with the words that Jesus reveals to us today. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to know what awaits us? Amen. Let's close in prayer tonight. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word tonight that has reminded us that you are in full control of all the events that take place now and the ones that will take place in the future. I pray, Lord, that we will not be in fear of the things that will take place or the days to come because it is only one moment closer to your son's return. And we look forward to that day in anticipation, Lord. We all say together, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. God bless you. I hope you are excited in knowing that your Redeemer lives and that one day we will reign with Him in glory. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.